Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number six for History 101, summer 2020. And what we're going to talk about next is uh, Jamestown, the first successful permanent colony by the British in North America. But before we start that, uh, what I wanted, we need to uh, explain the three types of British colonies that existed in North America. Now, uh, the first type, which Jamestown is an example of, is a joint stock colony, or sometimes you might see them referred to as corporate colonies. Uh, with a joint stock colony, shares in a company are sold to people in England and they buy these shares in the colony thinking that the shares will increase in value because the colonies that are established will become profit-making colonies and then all the shareholders will share in the profits. The company that starts uh, Jamestown is the Virginia Company. It's a joint stock colony or of investors. And uh, it's sanctioned by the crown, so it's issued a royal charter to start that joint stock colony. Now, the second type of colonies that existed were proprietary colonies. And what these are is they're colonies that are given to either an individual or a small group of individual Brits as a gift from the crown. The British crown owed typically influential people a favor or whatever, and they'll repay them by granting them a charter to start their own proprietary colony in North America, which they'll have a lot of leeway over how the colony is run. One prime example of a proprietary colony that you're all familiar with is Pennsylvania. And the proprietor was William Penn. His father was a very influential Brit who uh, the crown owed uh, favors to, and he called it in to get a colony for his son. And we'll talk about Pennsylvania later on. Third type of British colony that existed uh, was a royal colony. And that's a colony that is controlled directly by the crown. One way a colony would become a royal colony is if a joint stock company went bankrupt. They would then return their charter to the crown and the crown would take control of that colony. As we'll find out, that's going to be the case with Jamestown. Another way to become a royal colony is if a proprietary colony went bankrupt and the proprietor had to turn the charter back over. As we'll find out, that will be the case with when New Jersey was two colonies, East and West Jersey, and their proprietors, Berkeley and Cartier, went bankrupt. They mismanaged them and had to give it back to the crown. The crown then merged the two, East and West Jersey, and made the royal colony of New Jersey. <clears throat> so, royal. another way a royal colony would be created is if the British seize control of land like they did with New York. And we'll be talking later on when they seize control of the New Netherlands, the Dutch colony in North America, and then turned it into the Royal Colony of New York. So those are the three types of colonies, joint stock, proprietary, and royal. So on to Jamestown. There's a little lull in the action after the failure of Roanoke in 1590. Uh, what's gonna happen in the meantime? More detailed further mapping will take place of Virginia. Uh, in your book, you have a map showing colonization of uh, Virginia on page 58. 
And by 1606, a joint stock colony formed, the Virginia Company, as it was known, is prepared to go and try once again to establish a permanent British colony in North America. And this is sort of make or break. After the debacle of Roanoke, plus the fact that now we're into the 1600s, Spain's been in the New World in North and South America and the Caribbean for over 100 years now. And they are really firmly established and the boatloads of gold and silver are arriving at the treasuries in Madrid. France is underway, as we know. And Champlain and French colonists are in the St. Lawrence River Valley by this point. So the Brits have to make something happen or they're going to fall desperately behind. So the, uh, the Virginia Company in December of 1606 will send three ships to North America filled with men, boys, and supplies to build a profit-making colony. And they have very specific directions on where to establish this colony. Unlike the Roanoke colonists, they're not going to get lost. They have a detailed map that exists back in England, too, of the coast of Virginia. They're told to find the James River, which has been named in this further exploration, sail up the James River about 30 miles and start looking for a place to build a colony. <clears throat> so, very specific directions. The three ships sail up the James River, start looking. Uh, by the time they arrive, remember they left in December, they're not going to arrive until February. Because here's one thing I'll establish right now that many of you may not know. Back in this day and age, it took two months uh, to sail from the New World to England. And it took one month or so to sail back. So you're talking one or two months trip across the Atlantic, depending on how far south you're going also. So <clears throat> it's a long journey. They arrive the end of January, early February, and they start looking for a spot to build a colony. They're going to pick a peninsula that juts out into the James River as the place where they're going to build this. Now, <clears throat> the reason why they picked this, it's surrounded on three sides by water, so there's some military men with the, these original three ships. They believe that'll make it easier to defend. When they go on shore, they think there's a permanent source of drinking water. But remember, they're coming in the late winter, early spring in Virginia. The James River's near its highest levels because the snow's already starting to melt. And unfortunately, they picked a pretty lousy spot because by the time it gets to the late fall and the James River's down at really low levels, next to this peninsula on one side, is basically a swampy area that's filled with disease-bearing mosquitoes, yellow fever, malaria, and so forth, which will be a problem. Also, what they thought was a permanent uh, source of drinking water will dry up. It was a seasonal pond. So they're going to have to find other sources and they're going to have to do a lot of exploration and digging wells and so forth which wasn't in the plans. So, uh, they kind of start out with the deck stacked against them. And in the early going, for the first few years, things are moving at a snail's pace. And when uh, resupply ships, sometimes with officials from the Virginia Company aboard to inspect the progress, they're not happy because what's going on in Jamestown is these are all young men and boys. They're only putting in a few hours a day of work of clearing land, building buildings, and so forth. Then the rest of the time, they're exploring the area 
for gold and silver because they think it's going to be just like what the Spanish are finding, and they're going to find all these riches and get rich quick. <clears throat> also, there was a rumor that spread around that on the Atlantic shore of Virginia, on the beaches, which 30 miles, you know, down up down river, that jewels washed up on the shores. So this is almost sort of like El Dorado to these people. So a lot of days they're wasting the whole day by paddling down the James and going beachcombing for jewels, which obviously they're not going to find diamonds and rubies and emeralds on the shores of Virginia. So the Virginia company decides something must be done and they're going to send a strict disciplinarian over to take charge of Jamestown and whip these colonists into shape. That's the famous Captain John Smith, a retired military captain from the British Army. <clears throat> now, this is where the story probably starts to become familiar. <clears throat> Many of you as children probably watched the Disney full-length animated feature, Pocahontas. Now, we need to dispel some myths created by that Disney, uh, you know, animated feature. Obviously, it's like a movie. It's fictitious. So, let me just clarify a few things that you probably have in your minds left over from when you were children watching Pocahontas. I know my two now adult daughters watched that Disney film so many times they wore out the first VHS tape and their grandmother, unfortunately, bought them another one, which I wasn't too happy about, but that's a different story. So, <clears throat> You might remember Captain John Smith in the Disney portrayal. You obviously also remember the star character, Pocahontas. Now, Captain John Smith, when he arrived in uh, Jamestown in 1608, is an old grizzly war veteran who's been in many military campaigns, including fighting in India, and he's in his late 40s, and he's, you know, no better for the wear and tear of warfare. Now, obviously, if you remember him from the Disney portrayal, he was this young, dashing, blonde guy who is not what uh, Captain John Smith was about. And then there's Pocahontas. Pocahontas was the youngest daughter of the chief of an Indian confederation that existed in that area of Virginia, the Powhatan Confederation. She was the youngest daughter, and at the time when John Smith arrived uh, at Jamestown, she was 14 years old. Now, if you remember from the Disney portrayal, I can remember reading... Uh, reviews and criticisms of the movie at the time because it caused a lot of uproar with its uh, inaccurate portrayal of Native Americans and colonists and so forth, especially the history community was all up in arms. Uh, one reviewer wrote that Pocahontas was portrayed more or less as a Barbie in buckskins. She was a 14-year-old girl. Now, <clears throat> This is all misportrayed by Disney, and, you know, it even they insinuate that there's some sort of romantic connection between John Smith and Pocahontas, which never, ever happened. The only real true part from the uh, uh, animated feature is, you might remember that John Smith gets captured and is forced to go through what's known as a gauntlet by Chief Powhatan, and Pocahontas intervenes and begs and pleads for John Smith's life, and her father grants her wishes, so Pocahontas is able to return John Smith to Jamestown uh, alive, and 
she sort of becomes a hero there too. That's kind of true. What we know today in all likelihood happened was this was a big setup. Pocahontas was in on this. She's the chief's youngest daughter. He wanted her to have total access to Jamestown so she could go in and spy on the colonists and report back to him as to what's really going on there and are they a threat to the Powhatan Confederation, <clears throat> which, by the way, is in many ways similar to the Iroquois. Uh, at its height, the Powhatan Confederation of tribes had 14,000 members, and Chief Powhatan had 3,200 warriors at his disposal. So in the beginning, when Jan John Smith's there, if they decided to have an all-out attack on Jamestown, they could have wiped it off the face of the map. But they didn't. They were interested in cooperating at that point. So <clears throat> that's the, you know, dispelling the myths of the Disney portrayal. Back to the true story. John Smith uses his military discipline to whip these colonists into shape and get them to work 12, 15 hours a day building a colony. And it happens pretty fast once they really start working. Uh, John Smith will just be there for a brief period. He'll return back to England after some accidents. He's accidentally burned. And uh, he will return in 1609. That winner, the winner of 1609-1610, is a horrible time in Jamestown. They, It's going to become known as the starving time. Uh, it was a very, very long, harsh winter. They hadn't stored away enough food for the winter. And many people died of starvation. And it got so bad in Jamestown people were digging up corpses and eating them to survive. And one man was uh, later prosecuted for murdering his wife and then cooking her to survive. Uh, it was a horrible, horrible time. Now, one thing I forgot to mention to you last lecture about the fate of the Roanoke colonists, I was telling you all those different theories we ended up with the one about <clears throat> how uh, they probably joined up with the Chesapeans and migrated to the mountains of West Virginia 100 years later. The Another theory, theory I failed to mention, but it's pretty apropos for right now, was that the Croatoan Indians, which the name left on that plaque, were actually cannibals. And when the, they were, went and talked to him about what happened to the Jamestown colonists, or excuse me, the Roanoke colonists, they said, yeah, we've seen them before. We don't know what happened to them. So the thought was that what they were lying and what they had actually done is captured them all and ate them because they were cannibals, which later on will be proven to be completely false. The Croatoans were never, ever cannibalistic. Kind of ironic who the real cannibals were, isn't it? It was the Jamestown colonists in 1609-1610 who were the cannibals. So who are the savages on this continent? Now, the uh, next thing that we want to talk about with Jamestown also involves Pocahontas. As she becomes a young adult, she does indeed fall in love with the Jamestown colonist, a man by the name of John Rolfe. John Rolfe marries Pocahontas. So remember, part of the tradition in this area too is it's a matrilineal society. So John Rolfe becomes part of the tribe when he marries the chief's daughter, and the uh, Powhatan Indian Confederation will teach him how to cultivate tobacco. It's a crop that's brand new to Europeans growing in what they'd call the New World. 
Native Americans at the time grew tobacco, but they grew it to be used only for ceremonial purposes. They would smoke tobacco uh, at special events like births, weddings, and so forth. Uh, they would burn it sort of like incense to ward away, uh, you know, evil spirits and whatnot. Native Americans weren't standing around leaning on their home, you know, their longhouses smoking cigarettes. That's not the way it was. It was Europeans who extorted and distorted the use of tobacco. But regardless, that's going to be the savior of Jamestown. Once they start planting tobacco and it becomes a huge cash crop and high in high demand in Europe. That will be the savior of Jamestown and really of Virginia as a whole. Now, uh, Pocahontas, who had been having contact with uh, the British colonists since she was a teenager, was always fascinated by what England was really like. She'd hear stories about it and so forth from the colonists. And she always wanted to visit there to see what it was really like. Because remember, she couldn't just look at a coffee table picture book of it because there was no such thing as a photograph. So she finally gets to fulfill her lifelong dream and travels uh, to London. When she gets to London, she's treated like royalty. She has an audience with the queen, she gets uh, tours of all mu art museums. She sits in the royal box at an opera because as far as the British are concerned, she is royalty. She's an Indian princess because her father is a chief who in many cases, the Brits like to refer to chiefs as kings so they could relate to them, I suppose. So unfortunately, this is gonna cost Pocahontas her life. She had no inborn immunities to the diseases that ran rampant in London. The Thames River was like a cesspool and she will come down with who knows what. They say she died of consumption, which was a word for tuberculosis back then. She probably had several diseases and she never made it back alive and was buried in London. John Rolfe, her husband, and their child returned back, and John Rolfe continued a good relationship with the Powhatans because obviously he had the chief's grandchild. So, <clears throat> once tobacco is starting to be cultivated, the Virginia Company really puts the push on to make Jamestown a success. And they do so by sending more and more colonists, which are essentially sort of paid employees of the Virginia Company. And to give you an idea of how much effort they put into it, every year in a company report, they would do a census in Jamestown, a report to the company. Here's the population. So, in 1618, when the London, or excuse me, Virginia Company decides to put the final push on and send a lot of additional colonists to expand the operation. That year's report indicated that the population of Jamestown was approximately 700 people. Between 1618 and 1622, the Virginia Company will send an additional 3,000 colonists and including starting to send women so natural families could start in Jamestown. And when they did the company report census in 1622, the census reported the population was 1,240. Now remember, in 1618, it was 700. They sent 3,000 more. With natural growth, you might think, geez, they must be approaching 4,000. No, they were losing people as fast as they sent them there due to disease and due to conflict with Native American tribes throughout the region. They were encroaching on their land. There were wars between tribes and the Jamestown settlers, and it was a losing proposition. 
So finally, the Virginia company declares bankruptcy, turns the colony over to the crown, returns their charter, and it becomes a royal colony. And after that is when Jamestown in all of Virginia really starts to become prosperous within a few years, and it's because of tobacco. The Virginia Company just didn't have the will and the capital to hang on to it long enough. And another thing that made it so successful, once it becomes a royal colony, the British Crown doesn't care about profit at this point. They just want a surviving presence in North America which Jamestown and then Virginia certainly offered them. And as tobacco became valuable, it became a very prosperous center of British colonization. So uh, that's the story of Jamestown. We dispelled the myths of Disney. And finally, I would wrap this up uh, with a couple of other things about Jamestown. One is unfortunately... Jamestown in 1619 will be the beginning of African slavery in British colonies in, on the mainland of North America. When a Dutch trading vessel arrives and trades some slaves for tobacco with the Jamestown colonists and thus the onslaught of slavery in British colonies. A very unfortunate event and Unfortunately, the Virginia Company and the people involved in this transaction didn't seek the permission of the British government because there's thoughts the British government, who was at this time debating the legitimacy of slavery, may have told them no. <coughs> Excuse me. The other part about uh, Virginia that I would mention uh Next is that, you know, with the success that the Virginians had with tobacco, Virginia will emerge as the most powerful colony in all of the uh, British holdings in North America. And it'll be really the centerpiece of uh, their colonial experiment at the time. And it, it being a success, will have many other colonies follow after it. And uh, finally, the last thing that I would mention about Jamestown, and this has to do with the Disney portrayal, Disney caught a lot of flack for misportraying Native Americans and you know showing Pocahontas as uh, Barbie and Buckskins and whatnot. And they felt the pressure and they delivered. In 2006, we celebrated the anniversary of the founding of Jamestown. And in the 10-year period before that, uh, Dis the Disney Corporation funded a brand new archaeological exploration of the Jamestown area. And archaeologists found things in these digs that they never knew existed in the story of Jamestown. The artifacts found were then housed in a brand new museum that was built to commemorate the anniversary in 2006. And now uh, it's a much better interpreted site thanks to Disney feeling guilty about the video Pocahontas. So with most things, there's uh, a silver lining to it in the long run. So that's it for today. Next time I talk to you, I'm going to start talking to you about further British colonization just to the north in Maryland. And then we also have to talk about what happens in New England with the Pilgrims and the Puritans. So that's enough for today. I'll be at it again sometime next week. Make sure and get in there and uh, get into the discussion right away. As most of you know, yesterday I mailed out a great update. The discussions are a major part of your grade. You need to really participate in those. So now I've uh, you know, got a couple more video lectures to augment your textbook and the mini lecture links. So get right at it and get
get discussing. So, take care. Have a good weekend. I'll see you soon.